Good afternoon, everyone. The House Taxation Committee will be called to order. First item of business would be request for bill introductions, and we would like to recognize the illustrious chairman of the Ju Judiciary Committee. Is he here? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wondered who took my committee room, and it's nice to see that it's a tax committee. We enjoyed meeting in this room before you kicked us out. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a request. It's RS3440. It's on behalf of Friends of the Topeka Zoo, the Kansas Children's Discovery Center, and Shawnee County Parks and Rec. And it would put into place a mechanism to create the Gage Park Improvement Authority. Committee, any questions? Yes, Representative Alcala. So, uh, just a real quick answer, Fred. Is that meaning that we're going to give them taxing authority? What this legislation would do is it would give Shawnee County the ability to put an issue on a ballot that would create the authority and potentially give them a sales tax. But again, that's up to the county to determine at some future point. This just puts the mechanism in place that would allow that. I think we're a long way from that, though. Okay, thank you. So this is still an issue that they would have to go before the voters? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Representative Turner? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, we had a group in here from Gage Park, you know, that puts up the monuments and things. So is this overlapping or yeah, what would no, the new group okay, do so versus that? Thank you. I'm not completely aware of that, but from reading it in the news, uh, there, there you have a, a war memorial on the corner of Gage Park. So it's, it's a completely separate 501c3 that just happens to have their memorials in the park. So this is different. We're not exact asking for a tax exemption, which I think according to the media, that's what they asked for. Right. Yeah. Representative Corbett. I'm having a discussion with my neighbor here. What do you think the budget is for Shawnee County Parks and Rec? I have no idea. God, this is quite the committee. I was not prepared for that. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I withdraw the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I prepped them ahead of time. No, yeah, be no kidding. <laughs> is there any objection to the request? Seeing none, the request is approved. Thank you. Come any, back yeah, come back anytime. <laughs> Are there any further requests for bill introductions? I actually have two today. Uh, first one is RS3322. And that one is the, uh, I'll, I'll name it the Gartner. Uh, <laughs> this, this is the, uh, <laughs> this, the, this will be the uh, elimination of the social secu security cliff. Uh, it's, Identical. It's plagiarized from uh, Representative Gartner's bill from a couple of years ago. I don't remember what that bill number is, but uh, just reintroducing that for our consideration. Is there any questions? Any objections? Seeing none, the request is approved. And the second one I have is RS3432, and that is to address uh, Senate Bill 13 that we passed last year. Uh, the 20 mills, it is a statewide levy. It, technically, it's a local levy, but it's it's mandated at the state. So I wanted that 20 mills to be exempt from triggering the, the mechanism under Senate Bill 13 for holding the hearings. Uh, just figured the schools did not have to be, there's nothing they can do about that. So I wanted to exempt that from, from triggering that necessity of the hearing. I would entertain any questions. <laughs> any objection? Seeing none, the request is approved. Any further requests for bill introductions? Seeing none, committee, we'll move on to our first item of business. Actually, I need to uh, apologize to, to Leah and the committee. There was a miscommunication. House Bill 2719 was our third bill for the day. That'll be scheduled for tomorrow. There was a miscommunication on my part on when we'd be hearing that. So save your materials. Uh, we will take a look at that tomorrow. Today, our first bill is a hearing on House Bill 2684. And I would first turn to the reviser for an overview.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, House Bill 2684 would provide a sales tax exemption for a non-for-profit corporation that is designated as an area agency on aging by the Secretary of Aging and Disability Services and is exempt from federal income taxation um, and whose purpose is for coordinating and providing seniors and those living with disabilities with services that promote person-centered care, including home-delivered meals, congregate meal settings, long-term care, case management, transportation, information, assistance, and other preventative and intervention services to help service recipients remain in their homes and communities. Um, the sales tax exemption would be for purchases by the agency, agencies, excuse me, sales made by an area agency on aging and sales of, of, of construction materials um, for essentially constructing or remodeling a facility. And with that, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Adam. Committee, any questions for the revisor? Seeing none, we will move on to Department of Revenue for an overview of the fiscal note. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, Kathleen Smith with the Department of Revenue. Department of Revenue is estimating that House Bill 2684 would decrease state revenues by 130,000 in fiscal year 2023. Of that total, the state general fund would be estimated to decrease by 109,000 and the state highway fund by approximately 21,000 in fiscal year 2023. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would stand for questions. Thank you. Committee, are there any questions? <laughs> and Kathleen, in your uh, fiscal note, did you anticipate, is that just the sales, basically the sales um, purchases? I know if we get into any construction, that would be a, a very significant number or could potentially be. It could be. It could be uh, different, yes, sir. Um, when we talked with the... Um, different agencies, they had estimated what their impact would be. And I don't know at this point that they have any construction projects um, um, ready to go at this point. Nothing in the works. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Any further questions? Representative Kelly. Is, uh, I just wondered, this seems like something that triggers something in my mind that sounds like something we've done before or heard for like construction of, uh, living units and all of that is this something similar do you think uh this this is a little bit similar to what we've done in years past where we have ex, uh, issued uh, specific exemptions for expansion of properties uh construction and things like that this this is a little bit more encompassing where it's all purchases of goods and any potential construction projects <laughs> Representative Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Say, so just back to how you quantified this, as I read the testimony and then read your assessment, you say that there's 11 agencies in the state, currently eight that are not already getting an exemption. There are three that are public, apparently, and eight that are not. The three are getting the exemption. So you spoke with them to kind of quantify what their assessment was of yes. what that saved them in tax, and then you extrapolated that to the other eight. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Sir. All right, thank you. Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the area agency on aging, a lot of our communities have a senior center. Is the ownership on that different than the area agency on aging? I do not know. Okay. I would thank have you. to check that out. Okay, thank you. I know my local senior center is owned by the county. I don't know if local governments usually are the ones that own that. I can just speak for my county on that one. Okay. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you, Kathleen. Committee, our first proponent for House Bill 2684 is Leslie Anderson. She is with the Kansas Association of Area Agencies on Aging and Disabilities. Welcome to committee. Thank you very much. You have my written testimony, so I will be brief. I'm Leslie Anderson, representing the area agencies on aging throughout the state. And I'm not gonna say the whole 
name of the organization, so I'll just say K4AD. <laughs> um, you had asked the question about the area agencies on aging and those under the county government. This year, we put together our 2022 public policy priorities, and everyone voted on it. And so the three county government agencies were in support of the other eight becoming um, tax exempt for their sales. Um, the intent of this bill is to cause equity among all the 11 area agencies on aging, the network. When we have more money, that means more services, okay? We all know the value of services, especially when it comes to a person who wants to receive services in their home so they don't have to go to a nursing home. What we're doing here is we're taking money from the government to provide those services. And so the sales tax in itself, if it was exempt, would just be one of those things that would allow them to do more services during that fiscal year. So instead of recycling back into the state general revenue, they're going to use those services for um, direct benefit. Um, when we look at the value of providing these services, the area agencies on aging provide those high touch person-centered services so a person can remain in their home. That's why we believe that having more money to do more in the community just makes sense. And for those reasons, we ask that you support this bill and do pass out of the committee. And I'll stand for questions. Committee will go ahead and take questions for each conferee. Do we have any questions for this conferee? Representative Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what... Um, how did we get to three of them being uh, public and, and the others being private? I'm just curious of that. I think it was just when they started. So under the Older Americans Act, which is federal law, um, they have that um, allowance. And so it just made sense for some of the county governments to say, hey, we're already doing this um, and just departmentalized it that way. <laughs> Representative Wassinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm, one, I, I'm not sure I heard all the what you were talking about when you said you were going to include the other three that hadn't been in the state. I have, um, I've heard from quite a few agencies that, or groups, senior centers that provide food services for seniors, and a lot of people pick up food and bring them mm -hmm. to seniors to stay home. Uh, I don't see those as being included in this. Okay, so the way, and um, there are some area agency um, directors here who can probably provide more of a direct answer, um, but that is through a contractual basis. The senior centers um, provide the meals and the space for that, and they contract with the area agencies on aging. So then would they also have that sales tax exemption? Well, in Kansas, it's my understanding they each have to apply. It's not just a blanket for tax exemption, um, but you can probably ask those <laughs> directors who actually contract for those meals. Okay. okay. Well, I just know that I had the senior center in Ellis County has a problem with that. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee and questions? Representative Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> thank you, Leslie. Uh, First of all, thank you for the work you do as a member, as a former member of um, the Silverhead Legislature, because I am an older American. Uh, we appreciate the work that you do. And, and um, the, uh, I know last year you were given um, uh, the Older Americans Act received funding to increase the home services. Uh, and I, I guess the question I have is, uh, what what are some examples of some things that you might receive this uh, sales tax exemption for that you would purchase? Okay. 
So with regard to the increase, that was not through the Older Americans Act, that was the Senior Care Act services, and that was to replace funds that we had lost since technically 2014, if you look at the history. Um, under Older Americans Act, because that's federal dollars, that has remained the same for, for years. Um, but those home and community-based services might include um, in-home services, um, legal services, so they have contracts with providers out in the community. Um, then there are caregivers, so services to caregivers, um, different types of um, services that are needed to really stay in the community. And there is a, um, a needs assessment, so each area agency on aging is different based upon those services that are identified as a need in their community. But but some do you have and, and and I apologize I I misspoke that was the Senior Care Act, okay. which really allows people to stay in their homes and that certainly is much cheaper than the alternative. But do you have some specific examples? I mean, of what what your organization might purchase that this would apply to? So with um, the purchases, I'm going to defer to the executive directors who are here because they would have more knowledge of their um, standard purchases that they make throughout the year, if it's all right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Clayton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here. Uh, as a former member of the Johnson County Commission on Aging, I'm well aware of a lot of the issues that you all face, but I rolled off that board about, oh, two years ago, so that was right in the middle of COVID. I would like you to speak more to some of the costs and challenges that the area agencies on aging have faced due to COVID, especially with isolation of seniors in their homes and a decrease of volunteers, especially when it comes to in-home visits, and uh, in particular, if you could enumerate how this might help you all now that you've had to sort of pivot and evolve the, the way that you provide your care to people. So if you could tell us a little bit more about that, that would be helpful. Okay, that's a challenging question, especially on my level with the association. Um, the executive directors who are here can provide more information on that. But, you know, as organizations that are serving the public, we have the same issues, workforce issues, right? Um, it's difficult to find workers to go into the homes, um, increased pricing and things like that. So when we look at um, purchases, everything has increased, which means you pay more, that sales tax goes up with the amount that you pay. Um, so I guess, again, depending on the need of that particular area agency on aging and the services that they are providing, you'll have that difference in the sales tax that's paid. Thank you for that. And of course, happy to hear from anything the executive directors have to say with deference, of course, to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Our next conferee is Michelle Morgan, Northwest Kansas Area Agency on Aging. Welcome to committee. Thank you. I'm just so glad that we had this meeting today and not last Thursday when it was snowing. So that's a good thing. Well, good afternoon, um, Chairman Smith and members of the committee. My name is Michelle Morgan. I'm the Executive Director from the Northwest Kansas Area Agency on Aging in Hayes. So I will probably be on the hot seat here before long. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to visit with you about House Bill 2684. The Northwest Kansas Area Agency on Aging is part of a national network of agencies created in 1973 by the Older Americans Act. It is a private nonprofit organization with the responsibility of administering Older Americans Act programs in the 18 counties of Northwest Kansas. Designated as the single point of entry, we serve as the unbiased, trusted resource for older Americans and their caregivers. Whether it's information on available options, in-home services, nutrition services, or insurance counseling, a senior only needs to make a call to the local area agency on aging office to connect them with the resources needed to help them remain independent and in their communities for as long as possible. Additionally, as a grassroots organization, advocacy for older adults serves as a high priority of the Area Agency on Aging. 
According to the Administration for Community Living, by 2030, 7.3 million, 73 million, or one in five people in the U.S. will be 65 or older. Regardless of age, geographical location, income, or political affiliation, older adults generally agree on one thing. They want to age in their own homes and communities rather than in an institutional setting. To maximize the impact of service dollars for adults, I would ask that your committee consider establishing equity for the value of service dollars available to older adults in both the rural and the urban parts of our state. Currently, there are eight non-governmental, non-profit area agencies on aging that pay state sales tax, and three county government area agencies in aging in Kansas, Johnson, Wyandotte, and Sedgwick that are exempt from state sales tax. This state sales tax exemption is much needed as we face the challenge of a growing aging population in Kansas. For example, in Northwest Kansas, we paid approximately $15,000 in sales tax last year. If parity was established for the AAAs, my rural agency could provide more than 900 hours of attendant or homemaker care services to allow older adults to safely live in the setting of their choice. I respectfully request that the committee consider balancing the value of service dollars across the state so that no matter what region of Kansas an older adult chooses to live, as much service as possible is available to them. Services and providers are limited in Western Kansas, so it's imperative to have equitable value of allocated resources to be able to pay providers a competitive rate and ensure workers are available to meet the needs of older adults in Northwest Kansas. Thank you for your interest in House Bill 2684, which would establish taxation equity across the state for older Kansans in need of services. I would be pleased to try and answer any questions you may have. And you've heard some of the questions that were posed before. You, I'd be willing to let you have the floor for a few minutes and just address those if you want to. <laughs> well. Part of the um, addressing your question is that the Older Americans Act was established back in 1973. So that means that when that came down to the states, the states had to figure out how do we meet the needs of older needs across all of Kansas. So for instance, in Northwest Kansas, I have 18 counties. Really didn't make sense for each county government to try to start up an area agency on aging in their county for services. The larger counties that had the larger population, it probably made more sense for those county governments just to take that on. Um, in regards to um, Representative Wassinger's um, question that she had about senior centers. There are area agencies on aging also are able to put in requests for direct service waivers. So some of the more rural area agencies on aging, such as my own, we provide those nutrition services directly to those in our communities. So we have partnerships set up with the local community centers and the local senior centers to where they provide the space, we provide the service. So we pay for all the food, we pay for all the employees, we pay for everything that goes into the purchase and, and the delivery of that meal. And so it is a good partnership. Um, one thing back in the day is that senior centers were able to apply for a tax exemption as a nutrition site because they are designated as nutrition sites. However, they did not take on the costs of the nutrition services per se. Now in other areas of the state, such as Sedgwick County, um, they do contract out with other providers. North Central Flint Hills also is a direct service and provides their own. So depending on the area agency on, on aging in the state, that's how the, the change would happen. 
um, when it comes to what type of services we're talking about, something as simple as um, we have a customer who had throat cancer and tongue cancer. So they needed some nutritional supplements, some Insure. So obviously, if I wasn't paying sales tax on Insure, I could provide more of that to that person. Um, with the pandemic, with COVID, it was very difficult to provide services during this time because there was there were a lot of people that were scared. We had providers and their workers that were scared. We had families that didn't want anyone going into people's homes. So we had to get a little bit more creative. Um, even things like providing respite care with senior companions, those people were not allowed to go into the homes. And so we, we got creative and we said, okay, let's get Instacart in there. Let's try to get the providers to go to the grocery stores and purchase the supplies and the food that they need. Um, our nutrition providers, you know, hung in there. All of the senior centers, the volunteers kept delivering meals. We ended up purchasing iPads for all of the senior centers. And so with that, we could have purchased more if we wouldn't have been paying sales tax. But we purchased those because we do a lot of insurance counseling. So when Medicare Part D open and enrollment starts, that's all we do for over two months is just insurance counseling. And this was a way that people could connect with us in Hayes instead of traveling from Goodland, Kansas or Norton or Phillipsburg. They could call in or they could connect with us via Zoom. So those are just a, a few examples. Thank you. Committee, are there any questions? Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So how many employees would each side have? How many paid employees would each location have? At the senior centers? In my area, I can only speak for Northwest Kansas. I have 18 counties, and, um, and at those places, we have 28 nutrition sites, and 13 of them are kitchens. So depending on whether or not the kitchen transports food out or whether they just cook for their community, it could be anywhere from one to three employees. And that's not very many. No, no. We, we really, um, these programs really, really are ran on volunteerism and community support. So with that being said, what is the, what would be a compensation wage roughly? For at the kitchens? I would say probably anywhere between 8 and $11 an hour, and which is something that we really struggle with because right now you're seeing that a lot of the fast food places are paying 11 to $15 an hour, or they're saying, you work today, we'll pay you today. So even workforce for us has been a big issue, like it is for everybody else, so just trying to attract people. Thank you. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And along the same lines, so how short of workforce are you? I know you can only speak for Northwest Kansas, but if you had qualified applicants uh, today, how many could you hire? Well, we need a cook in Goodland that we've been advertising for probably three months. I know we need a cook in Colby that we've been advertising for for over six months. And, um, and people are just telling us they can't do it for less than $13 an hour. Um, trying to think of where else. I think everywhere else we're pretty much fully staffed, but those are our big ones. Atwood, we have someone, too, that we need to fill a position there. So would part of what you do with this money be to uh, make your salaries more competitive? It could. I mean, it absolutely would free up service dollars or free up dollars so that we could put more into services. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Say, um, you mentioned that this would bring tax equity between those urban um, county provided and the, and the more rural. Uh, will is this, Does this bill accomplish that? Or are there, I don't know what the operational differences are in terms of, I see in some testimony uh, vehicles, for example. Are the county 
using county vehicles? They're not having to buy vehicles? Do you have to buy vehicles? We do. We okay. have to buy vehicles. You know, since we do cover the 18 counties of Northwest Kansas, we do travel out to people's homes. We do do in-person assessments. We go to all 28 of our locations. So yes, vehicles are one of the expenses. And then another part of it is talking about construction of facilities. Uh, again, a county may use county facilities, I'm going to guess, and, and you don't get okay. that. So right. you're... We have our own, right. And there are some of us that rent and some of us that do own our own buildings. And then what about volunteerism? Is that pretty much the same, whether it's a county or a private? Right. We they... all rely on this. The Older Americans Act programs and senior programs really are... Um, we're built from the grassroots level. And so if we didn't have volunteers in all of these communities, we'd never be able to do it, especially when it comes to the nutrition program. But the urban one relies as much on volunteers. They don't all have county I, employees. So I would say they do, okay. you know, especially for those programs. All right. Thank you for your answers and thank you for your testimony. Sure. Representative Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Morgan, for the work that you do. I know how important that is, and uh, the salaries aren't that good. Um, but it sounds like a lot of the the items you would buy would be food items. Is that correct? I mean, could you give us a percentage of what that might be? You know, the thing is, is that, for instance, for me, the nutrition program specifically is exempt from state, state sales tax. Anything else that the Area Agency on Aging provides, you know, whether it is the vehicles, the iPads, the insurer, a bath bench, a lift chair, um, incontinence supplies, all of those type of things are taxed. And in fact, when we have our audit, our nutrition program is audited separate from the Area Agency on Aging because we have to be so careful to keep those things separate. Um, but when it comes to in-home services, for um, help in the home, you know, those are the kind of things like cleaning supplies. We run into hoarding issues sometimes to where we've got to buy a vacuum. We've got to buy cleaning supplies just to get providers to go in there and try to clean some of this up. So we are talking about, you know, things that really do more directly come into contact with the clients. And, and absolutely, obviously, we have to have iPads and computers to do the assessments and to manage the programs. And so those are things that would be exempt that currently are not. Okay. Mr. Chairman, one more. I, so could you explain then the, nu the nutrition items you don't pay, you currently don't pay sales tax on? And how is, how is that? Uh, if, if it is directly related to the preparation and delivery of food, it is tax exempt, but it has to be directly related to the preparation and delivery. And that's what we do then at the senior centers in my area is that we actually prepare the food, we pay for all the food and the delivery to get it out there. I mean, is that something that this committee exempted at some point? Oh, yes, many Long years time ago. ago, many, many, many years ago. Okay. And I think that's kind of where some of the confusion was with some of the senior centers that served as nutrition sites. They had also applied for the same type of exemption, and it really is for direct preparation and delivery. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rep Representative Gardner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm... <laughs> Uh, let's see if I understand. Thank you for being here. Understand this. We have some area agencies that are affiliated and administered by counties. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. And then we have others. You're a great example that encompasses 18 counties. And I would ask it. In those 18 counties, what do you have one county that receives more services than other counties because of their population, I guess? Would that be a, uh, an appropriate 
Uh, yes, I would say it is simply because, for instance, Ellis County versus Wallace County, population is significantly different. So, yes, absolutely, we are providing more in-home services in that county than in Wallace County. Now, um, when it comes to nutrition services, every county has services available for nutrition in some format. Um, may not be the same level, but yes, we do. That is one of the things that we work really hard on is trying to make sure that we do have that equity and that the service is available. Um, and you know, and when we're really looking at this, what we're saying is that just let my dollar be worth the same as it is in another part of the state. I, you know, I, yeah, that's basically that. what we're talking about. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, just to follow up. And I, I would think that uh, counties are very appreciative of your services and they benefit their uh, the the folks that live in that county benefit. I I guess where I'm going, have you ever discussed the idea of sitting down with a county and having a public private partnership where they could administer or help administer and then you would be tax exempt? Do you see where I'm headed? <laughs> well, um, and I might refer this back to our chair who was a past county commissioner. I would find that I would believe, and no, I haven't ever had that conversation exactly, but I would be shocked if I had very many counties that would go for that. Um, I will say that all of our counties are very good about providing some type of match for services in our area because we are required to have match dollars in order to pull down federal dollars. Um, so all of our counties are extremely supportive and I can't say enough about them, but no, I've never had that conversation and, and I'd, I'd be shocked if it really went that well, but <laughs> it's an idea. It's an idea. i just thank you so much. Sure. I, I would just comment that they can do a much better job than the county commissioners ever could. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Our next conferee is Julie Covert Walter with the North Central Flint Hills Area Agency I agent. Good afternoon, Chairman Smith, and good afternoon, members of the tax committee. I am Julie Gover Walter with the North Central Flint Hills Area Agency on Aging, and I'm executive director of our organization. Our agency serves 18 counties, just like Michelle, but our counties are obviously different, and it's like you have a lot of changing demographics and a lot of different demographics. Our agency is in the heartland of the state. And of course, our agency is one of the 11 area agencies on aging that are not affiliated uh, with a county government. Uh, there, of course, as already been said, there's three others that are affiliated with county government, and we all basically use primarily federal and state resources in order to carry out our respective missions. Um, currently, our agency, uh, our direct expenditures, as Michelle said, are not part where they're not taxed, they're not subject to sales tax because of the nutrition services. They're, they're related to the nutrition services. We do have a direct service waiver similar to what uh, Northwest Kansas has and obviously expenditures that are directly related to the nutrition operations in our, in, in our 18 counties uh, senior centers serving Older Americans Act meals, those are already tax exempt. So what we're talking about again is equity on the other kinds of expenses that area agencies on aging that are not affiliated with the county government end up having to pay for in order to successfully meet our service mission. Uh, and I listed in my testimony the various services, um, highlighted those that our agency provides. You can read about those in, your, in what I provided you. Um, and again, I just emphasize that although 
nutrition in our region, it's called Friendship Meals, is a very important and very key service in order to carrying out our mission. The fact is our mission to do the work to help older Kansans, people living with disabilities, and their caregivers remain maintaining their well-being in their home communities with the least restrictions, that is, that, that's what we're talking about here. And that requires additional kinds of money and different kinds of services. So again, our agency supports the bill that we're talking about here to create parity among those that are currently the county government affiliated area agencies on aging and those eight that are primarily serving rural Kansans that are not affiliated with county government at this point. And I just want to also say that if those eight area agencies on aging serving 99 of our 105 counties in the state were not doing these services, well, there would be another tax exempt entity, either the state or county, that would be providing these services. So that's, again, one of the things I wanna emphasize here is the equity part. I also wanna mention that in 1998, our agency acquired a wonderful building, uh, formerly an old post office, and then it was a federal building in downtown Manhattan. We acquired it through federal surplus property. And it's a very good building. In fact, if you're ever in Manhattan and there's a tornado warning, come on over to the Area Agency on Aging Office in downtown Manhattan because the engineers that worked on our construction and remodel back in the early 2000s said, hey, we want to be there if the tornado sirens go off. So it's well constructed. It's a good building. However, as you know, every building needs some attention from time to time. And this happened to us in 2019 when the boiler in our building died. Now, that's just part of life sometimes, but that boiler dying meant that our agency had to raise funds for a major HVAC project, somewhere around the, the sum of $300,000. And we worked very diligently, not only to get good bids and get the work done and get it done right, but of course, doing the fundraising. But of that $300,000 expenditure, our agency ended up having to pay something close to $30,000 in sales tax. Now, if we would have been a county affiliated organization, we wouldn't have necessarily had to pay that sales tax because that building would have been part of county government and the county and taxpayers in that county would have paid. With that $30,000, we would have been able to provide something like an additional 5,000 meals to people in our region or been able to serve about nine people throughout the year on the Senior Care Act at current levels of average level of expenditure. And, you know, we're, we're focused on doing that work. We're focused on, on making sure that people, doing whatever we can to make sure people in our 18 county region are living with dignity and well-being in their homes, in the communities, in our part of the state. I'm asking you to think about the fairness that the, in this situation, and I'm asking you to support this House Bill 2684 because we think it's the right thing to do, and it does address the parity issues that we're seeing in the way the eight non-government affiliated organizations are providing versus the county affiliated ones. And we love our colleagues in the counties. We love the eight area agencies on aging. We're all in it together, but we're just asking for consideration that would make things a little bit more fair. Are there any questions? I'll do my best to answer them. Representative Highland. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Julie, thank you for coming and appreciate the work you do. The uh, You mentioned that you own your building, is that correct? That's correct. Now, are you taxed on that building property? We are not taxed on that. We've, uh, the county of Riley County has graciously uh, given us an exemption for that property tax. Okay, good, good. So, uh, and you mentioned in your text here, uh, vehicles, do you, how many vehicles do you have in your organization? Right now, a fleet of vehicles is right about 20. Wow. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Representative Highland. Further questions, committee? Seeing none, thank you for your Thank testimony. you very much. Committee, our last uh, proponent conferee I have listed is Cindy Lane, and I believe she is joining us via WebEx. Cindy, are you there? I yeah. am, <laughs> and I'm unmuted, so that's a good thing. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you. Uh, my colleagues, the other area agency directors, have done a very good job of uh, providing information to you, but I did want to cover a couple things uh, that uh, some of you have asked. Uh, you were wondering to know what types of things we purchase for those seniors, and so I did. I do have a listing in my testimony. Uh, some examples are window air conditioners, incontinence supplies, food and food supplements, walkers, bath benches, space heaters, hearing aids, bedding, eyeglasses, and medications. So we have purchased those items for some of our seniors. Also, when we talk about modifications or repairs, we're talking about minor mod minor home modifications for individuals. I've had people who've had to have their floor replaced in the bathroom because it was sinking. So we have done some minor home repair. Uh, we've provided maintenance of yards, uh, utility payments, and pest controls. Um, I also wanted to point out that there are other organizations in our communities that have such as the Community Developmental Disability Organizations, they are tax exempt, uh, as well as the units of government that we've brought up. And so we are just asking for consideration to have equal uh, power of, of purchase. Uh, I, that is all I really want to say at this time. And if you have questions, I'd be glad to answer them. <laughs> Cindy, thank you for your testimony. I know we've we've covered this uh, quite well. All all of the conferees have done a great job. And are there any questions for this final conferee? Looks like you may have gotten off easy. So yeah. <laughs> thank you for your testimony, Cindy. Thank you. Are there any other conferees that are wishing to appear as a proponent or opponent for House Bill twenty six eighty four? Seeing none, we will close the hearing on House Bill 2684 and thank everyone for their, their testimony. Now, we'll committee, we will open up the hearing on House Bill 2709 and once again turn to the revisor for an overview. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 2709 would also provide a sales tax exemption for purchases made by a not-for-profit corporation um, exempt from income tax that operates a theater in the state of Kansas that provides the following items. <clears throat> the creation and production of novel works for concerts or productions, the employment of a full-time theater staff, a board of directors and governance of the organization that provides a partnership between the board and the theater staff and a connection to the community by insur ins ensuring sound business and financial practices and a commitment to bringing new thoughts and ideas to the governance of the organization, the dedication to providing strong educational commitments to the community in which the th such theater is located, and the commitment to providing ongoing live theater as an art form using available local resources. 
And with that, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Committee, do you have any questions? Representative Helgerson. Would this be for the all of the production, but also for the tickets? The production and all the uh, scenery, et cetera, that they may have, uh, but then they also sell tickets. And would the tickets be sales tax? Two different categories. You're correct. This would only be for purchases by the organization, not sales made by the organization. So a ticket sale would be made by the organization, would not be exempt under this provision. Okay. And it's it's right now taxable, correct? Um, I'd have to probably defer to the Department of Revenue if they have. I, I'm not entirely certain. Okay. Thank you. Adam, I just had a few questions on the on the list of qualifying. I understand we're trying to uh, create a fairly narrow um, gap where on who qualifies for this or not. But uh, for instance, on number four, how do you how do you quantify whether there, someone is dedicated to providing strong educational commitments? Is there is there something in their bylaws that they have to have, or how do you determine who qualifies for some of these? You're correct. There is no like hard standard that I can point to. Um, it would probably be there interpreted by the Department of Revenue and just their general um, operating agreements or something like that. Okay. Committee, any further questions? Representative Highland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Am I reading this correct? That would be sales tax exempt for uh, consumer material for such electronic cigarettes, cereal malt beverage, malt products. Is that would be tax exempt? Am I reading that correctly? If if you're referring to the first pages of the bill, those are that's all current law, so that wouldn't really apply to this section. But if you're if, you're, if that's it's in general, are you referring to just a general question of cereal malt beverages and things like that? I have to look. I believe like cigarettes and stuff are subject under the first provision. Certain articles are generally exempt if they're subject to another tax, but then we bring them out of the exemption and back under sales tax. So things like cigarettes are both subject to their own sales or their own tax and sales tax. Um, so I believe if that's what you're referring to, those items would also be subject to sales tax in addition to their own excise tax. Okay. They have their own excise tax as you stated, but the sales tax, they would be exempt from that. They would know there would be a sales tax levied on those purchases. It's an exemption to the exemption, so it basically means the sales tax is put back on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. It gets very confusing. <laughs> Representative Sanders. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, what this bill we're talking about today, 2709, basically, I think it's pages 37 and 38, because everything that comes before that is already in state law, correct? Correct. The, the prior provisions, excuse me, dealing with cereal malt liquor and cigarettes have nothing to do with the underlying provision here. So the things that Representative Highland were talking about is not the topic of this bill? That would be correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further questions for the reviser? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, Committee, do we have any questions on the fiscal note? It's very, very straightforward and basic. If you want Kathleen to come up, I'm sure she would be happy to. But if we are, if we don't have any questions on the fiscal note, we'll go ahead and move right along to proponent testimony. And first, committee, I have um, Michael Spicer, the executive director of Salina Community Theater. Welcome to committee. Good afternoon, Chairman Smith and committee members. I am Michael Spicer, and I've been the executive director of Salina Community Theater for the past 24 years. Thank you for inviting us here this afternoon to speak in favor of the passage of House Bill 2709. 
The organizations described in this bill are unique in what they offer and essential to the cultural fabric of the cities, of their regions, and indeed the state of Kansas. Each of them creates the entirety of the art that they present within the resources available to them within their communities. Every set, every costume, every property is designed and crafted for the production it serves. All of the performers are rehearsed and guided by creative teams for the enjoyment of local, regional, and national audiences. The limited offset to this state will be completely reinvested in the local economies because we are nonprofit and self-producing. Every dollar that comes through our doors is used for the creation of live theater and the enjoyment of our audiences. Although performing arts centers are an important element of the cultural landscape within each community, a significant number of those dollars migrate out of the local and state economies with the contracted artists that they present. 100% of this request will be reinvested in our theaters. As I said, I have been with Salina Community Theater for 24 years, so I am most knowledgeable and most passionate about what it means to us. In real dollars, our annual savings would represent the royalties and rentals of one of our four musicals, or the cost of paint for an entire year, or the salaries of the creative team for the summer stage youth production. Even though we're located in the middle of Kansas, SCT is the only year-round provider of live theater and educational opportunities for adults and children between Topeka and Denver. We will sell tickets uh, in more than 50 counties and 80 towns and cities, and indeed in 2021, we sold tickets in 30 states outside of Kansas. And all of those patrons spend exponentially more than the cost of the offset of this bill in those local economies for food, gas, lodging, other events, and shopping. Additionally, we are not asking for an exemption on the tickets we vend, only on the items we purchase to create the live theater experience. At Salina Community Theater, our, our education program operates on the principle that no child is ever turned away because of an inability to pay. Last week, we brought more than 2,200 students into our theater to see a play that was created for them and performed by young people. The audiences came from Minneapolis, Junction City, Wilson, Central Plains, Smoky Valley, and Twin Valley, as well as from Salina. We tell the teachers that if a child doesn't have the $5 fee, bring them anyway. And please don't take the money out of your own pocket because we know you will, we've seen you do it. We feel that the experience, this experience at this age is more important and more valuable than a fee. If I communicate nothing else, let it be this. This investment in these theaters allows us to increase the quality of what we do, which elevates patron satisfaction that in turn increases the number of patrons that we have, ultimately returning more revenue back to our local and to the state economies. Thank you. I stand for your questions if you need. Thank you. Committee, are there any questions? Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. My wife is the head of the local arts council, so I, I know all about volunteerism and building sets. Um, how many employees do you have? I have seven full-time and three part-time employees. That doesn't count the number of interns that we hire during the year and in the summer, nor the musicians, the musical directors, the choreographers that we contract with throughout the year to help create these. I, I think... In a, in a normal year, we would hire in excess of 200 contract employees to come in and help us create the, th the live theater that we do. Okay, that answered my question. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Our next conferee is Angela Cassette, Music Theater of Wichita. Welcome to committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Smith and committee members. My name is Angela Cassette, and I am the Managing Director of Music Theater Wichita, an organization that just celebrated its 50th anniversary of producing professional large-scale musicals for Kansans. Thank you for inviting me this afternoon to testify in favor of passage of HB 2709. 
I came here today to ask all of you to invest in us, the nonprofit theaters in your state, as we invest in our communities. It will come as no surprise to you that the past two years have been very challenging for arts organizations. The very foundation of our art form is performers and technicians in close quarters singing in each other's direction to a packed house. The pandemic turned these previously benign activities into something highly dangerous. But in our state, we regrouped, we reinvented, and we figured out how to use our often lauded creativity to apply to our small not-for-profit businesses. At Music Theater Wichita, we used pandemic era funding and our other revenues to retain jo jobs and to create new ones. We did not lay off full-time staff during the pandemic. Rather, as we moved through, we added full-time positions and invested more deeply in hiring local theatrical technicians, such as carpenters to build sets. We hired small local businesses to do things like produce a television special and mount outdoor productions. We also welcomed another organization into our own. Music Theater for Young People became Music Theater Wichita's flagship education program. I say all of this to illustrate by our past action what we would do with this tax relief. We will invest in people, creating jobs, and fostering the creative economy in our state. We are particularly poised to invest in young people. This week at Music Theater Wichita, we are in tech, the process of putting actors on stage with sound and lights and doing final preparations for performances. We're producing Frozen Junior featuring 81 children. Many of these kids are first time performers, learning teamwork and poise and a host of skills. As part of this process, we have hired local teachers, designers, carpenters, customers. I don't need to lecture any of you on the impact of keeping people employed. But if we invest the $30,000 or so per year in tax relief that this bill would afford us, and we put it back into hiring people, that loss of sales tax revenue to the state starts to impact our state's economy in other ways, in payroll and income taxes, and summer employees brought into Kansas to rent apartments and spend money. I will add that while my organization proudly makes its home in Wichita, we have a front row seat for the theatrical achievements across our state. I'm so happy to speak for my colleagues across Kansas today, and I know that musical theater is a passion in Kansas for both the young and for the not so young. We, similar to Salina Community Theater, have patrons come from all over Kansas and several other adjoining states. One in four of our audience members come from outside Sedgwick County. And at Music Theater Wichita, we see productions of 50 or so high schools across the state as well as part of our annual Jester Awards. To name only a few, this year Topeka West uh, delighted audiences and younger kids with a stage version of Schoolhouse Rock. Those of you who know Schoolhouse Rock will remember the earworm, I'm just a bill, about a bill that dreams of becoming a law, and we hope the same for this. Um, the next up is Independence High uh, with some classic Gershwin singing and dancing. And several years, Hayes High has won so many awards, we were accused of rigging the competition. These students across the state work hard and deserve stable professional theaters in their states because for many Kansas families, trips to destinations like New York are not possible. This bill would help our professional theaters survive and thrive in the post-COVID era, and it would also put us on a level playing field with the other arts and culture organizations in our state. Our zoos, museums, and more have been tax exempt for more than 20 years. I thank you for your time and stand for questions if you have any. Thank you for your testimony. Committee, are there any questions? Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Angela, thank you for being here. And could you characterize the kind of young people you work with? I mean, some kids are really into sports. Some kids are really into music. Can you sort of characterize the kids that you work with? Is theater their big deal? Sure. Yeah, we have a lot of students for whom theater is their primary passion. Um, we also, this week, we're seeing a lot of children who are really exploring what they like to do. They might they might be sports kids. Um, that's one of the things that really impresses me at some of the high schools across the state is they're very good about getting um just having children explore all of the things that they might be able to do. Um, I find that most of the children who work with us are not going to go on and become Broadway performers. Most of them are going to stay in their local communities, but they will be arts patrons. Uh, they, those skills transfer um, 
the, I think the public speaking skills would transfer well to things like marketing. We've got a lot of former, uh, got a lot of attorneys that were part of our programs, um, lawmakers, you know, so I think that those skills really transfer nicely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. There at the end, you mentioned that passage of this bill would put you on par with other cultural, and I didn't catch what it was that you were making that pitch. Sure. So I believe it's been since the early 1980s that museums have been tax exempt. Um, so like locally to Wichita, our art museum and um, I believe Exploration Place, which is our science museum, our historical society, they are all tax exempt. Um, our zoos have been tax exempt, I believe, since the early 90s. Um, so most of the arts and cultural uh, institutions across the state are already part of this. I think it's a 37 or 47 page bill. They're listed earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions? Double check online. Seeing none. Oh, Representative Wassinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. I, more, mine is more of, the, more of a comment because I was one of the founding members of the Heartland Community Theater and got the 501c3 for it and volunteered at Thomas More Prep Marion in the drama department for a long time. So I can personally testify that this gives outlet for a lot of kids that aren't accepted in different areas. And it's amazing to see how many children will come in and be accepted by their fellow castmates when this is the one place that they're not the weird kid. They're not the, the you know, they come dressed in different things and everyone thinks it's just great. You just do what you need to. And I know for a fact that it helps with public speaking as well as um, math skills too, because they're learning music and uh, learning beats and that translates very well. So I appreciate all that you guys do and I, I appreciate the outlet that you provide. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. Seeing no further questions, thank you for your testimony. Committee, I'd also address your attention to written proponent testimony in your packet. Is there anyone else wishing to appear as a conferee on House Bill 2709? Seeing none, we will close the hearing on 2709. As I stated earlier, we will postpone House Bill 2719 till tomorrow and now take a look at Senate Bill 327 and turn to the reviser's office for an overview. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sales, or Senate Bill 327, excuse me, would exclude from the definition of sales and sale or selling price um, and determining the sales tax that would be uh, imposed on delivery charges um, on, those that are, on those that are separately stated on the invoice, bill of sale, or similar document gave, given to the purchaser. Essentially, in practice, what this does is while it amends the, uh, the definition section, sales tax would not be charged on delivery charges if, there's a, if, they, are, if they are essentially broken out um, of the underlying cost. Currently, all delivery charges are subject to sales tax in Kansas. And with that, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Committee, are there any questions for the reviser? Is this something that has become more prevalent with, with the onset of all the, the app, the, the DoorDash? The, I'm not even sure what all the, <laughs> the names are, but it seems like there are a lot of more, a lot more food delivery services available. Have, have they all, have always been taxed on these delivery charges? I, I'm not aware of any change. You know, the underlying provisions have been in effect since I've been here for at least 10 years, so I'm not aware of any changes. You know, kind of like the automobile things has come on, come off. This, is, to my knowledge, has always been this this way. <laughs> Seeing no questions, thank you, Adam. <laughs> Uh, does Department of Revenue want to 
review the fiscal note on this one. It is a little bit larger, so we may appreciate a, a little bit of fiscal insight. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, Kathleen Smith with the Department of Revenue. Senate Bill 327 would decrease the state revenues by around $4.8 million in fiscal year 2023. Of that total, the state general fund would be estimated to decrease by $4 million and the state highway fund by $800,000. To formulate these estimates, what we looked at was um, retail sales tax from fiscal year 2021, and we looked at the retail trade. And we made an assumption that for retail sales tax, we assumed that 0.1% of the amount was for delivery charges. And so that would equate then to a 1.8 million um, fiscal impact for the retail sales tax trade. We also looked at the compensating use tax numbers um, and again, the retail trade on the compensating use tax. And we, we made the assumption there that 1% of the total sales was for delivery charges. And so we came up with an impact of 3.1 or 3.0 million for the use tax. So in all, the total is 4.8 million. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would stand for questions. Thank you, Kathleen. There is really no way to tell, I mean, other than looking at receipts, which companies are charging how much as uh, Representative Gardner and I just said, you know, you've been able to get pizzas delivered for free for years. But I think a lot of the, you know, Uber Eats and all the, all the different delivery, food delivery services that are out there, I think that's where these delivery charges are starting to be taxed. But there's no way to, to analyze how, those, how that money is coming in at the department level. That is correct, uh, Mr. Chairman, because the uh, the total, what we're getting is the total sales price, which includes the, the delivery charges. So again, we had to make some assumptions to move those out. So it's very difficult. Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does that include automobiles, the delivery fee on automobiles? It would include um, the retail trade, and yes, those would be included in there, yes our assumption that we made, yes. Because they've really moved that number up a bunch on the last few years. Okay, thank you. Representative Corbett. <clears throat> Kathleen, are there, are there any states that do not charge for these services? I can tell you what I have for the streamlined states because we are in compliance the way the uh, legislation is worded. We are in compliance with streamlined sales tax because it does give states the option to um, exclude those from the selling price or not. Of the 24 states that are in the streamlined agreement, um, four states are excluding the delivery charges from the sales price. So the other um, 19 are not. Thank you. <laughs> Committee, further questions for Kathleen? Seeing none, thank you. Our, our only proponent we have showing for this, uh, appearing before the committee, is Barbara Saldivar. I hope I got the last name correct there, uh, from Topeka, Kansas. Welcome to committee. Thank you. You got it right. <laughs> well, I'm just a concerned citizen who's, uh, you know, we don't like to pay taxes. <laughs> and uh, I just recently heard that we do have to pay taxes on like I think it's like on online purchases and things like things like that um, so I'm just requesting that uh, maybe we not have to pay this tax um, it just it just seems like it's a hidden tax and um, also you know with inflation and all this going on it's just one more thing that can maybe help us out out here with our household budgets uh, we as a taxpayer I appreciate your help in helping to make these ends meet in our budget and uh, just please pass SB 327 
uh, favorably out of your committee, and thank you very much. If you have any questions, I will answer them, but we would certainly be willing to. Uh, committee, are there any questions? Representative Corbett. <clears throat> I do agree with you. We are taxed to death, and anything we can cut up here would be a blessing to anybody that lives here. Thanks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> any further questions? Yes, Representative Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for being here and testifying today. But I do kind of have a question. I mean, when uh, you're reviewing this bill and kind of looking over it, What's your estimate? Sorry if you can't hear me. This microphone is. What would your estimate be? What this? Uh, what this would probably save you a year? Me personally. Personally. Well, it wouldn't be as much as as was quoted a while ago. <laughs> it would be. Uh, I really don't have a proper one, but I can probably figure it out and give it to you, uh, Representative Kessler. Right. I'll figure it mine out. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sure. I, I don't need to get that information. I just know if you had that number on, on top of your okay. head, you've already kind of thought about how, how much this bill would mean in something like that, or if it would fairly insignificant or fairly, you know, sizable. I, I was just curious. Offhand, I would say in the hundreds, maybe by the time of the end, but you know, it depends on how much you buy, I guess. Repres Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm certainly, uh, like Representative Corbett, in agreement that none of us really likes to pay taxes. Is this going to curtail how much food you purchase to be delivered? Actually, we've cut down on going to restaurants. We just feel like we can't afford it anymore. Uh, we think that it, it, we can save money by staying home. The gas is really tremendous nowadays. Uh, Little story, my husband was at the gas station this morning and there was a, uh, he was filling the tank and he noticed the car next door and this poor dog was hanging his head out the door looking very, very sad and watching the tank and I kind of feel the same way as that <laughs> poor little dog. <laughs> Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am, for your testimony. Um, the this would be the delivery charge. Would you prefer that we pass a sales tax exemption on the food rather than the delivery charge? I would like both. <laughs> but if you had to choose one or the other. Food would be very beneficial. Yeah. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Committee, we also have written testimony, a proponent testimony from Randy Stuckey, Kansas Grain and Feed Association. Are there anyone, are there any other conferees wishing to appear on behalf of Senate Bill 327? Seeing none, I, I meant to ask either revise or research. This passed out of the Senate, I believe it was on the consent calendar, was it not? Yeah, I was just curious what the what the vote was on that, Eddie. Yes, yeah, sir. Representative, uh, as several people have uh, chimed in up here, the, the, but for the benefit of people online, uh, it was uh, 40 to 0, and the, the committee did put this bill on the consent calendar on the Senate. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. If there is no other business before the committee, we are adjourned. <laughs>